Well done. In a few short minutes, you will be halfway through knowing and understanding the Iliad. Hello and welcome or welcome back. Today, as always, we're going to be going through the great books of Western civilization, beginning with the Iliad. This is book 12 out of the Robert Fagel's translation. I will be starting with a brief plot summary, and then we will get into analysis and commentary of the major themes and character developments. The book begins with a reminder from Homer that the Greeks did not sacrifice to the gods before building their wall, or the great trench in front of it. Homer then narrates the destruction of the wall, long after the Trojan War's conclusion. Poseidon, Zeus, and Apollo all work together with earthquakes, storms, and great floods to tear the wall down and sweep it into the ocean for good. After this, the narrative returns to the war where we left off in the last book. The Greek armies retreat behind their trench, with Hector and the Trojans in hot pursuit. Polydamas, Hector's lieutenant and friend, urges him to have all of the soldiers, including himself, dismount from their chariots before running through the trench, for the sharp stakes and the great depth and breadth of the trench will make it impossible to be effective while still mounted on their chariots. Hector agrees and dismounts from the car, and most of his other captains and their soldiers follow suit. As they do so, however, one Trojan soldier called Asius tries to cross the trench in his chariot anyway. He is quickly killed by Idomeneus, one of the Greek captains, while two other Greek spearmen among all those fleeing turn and guard the gate, preventing any Trojans from getting close. Hector, Polydamas, and all of those with him are about to make their way across the trench when a sudden omen appears before their eyes. An eagle, a symbol of Zeus, flying overhead and carrying a snake, which then bites the chest of the eagle, forcing the eagle to drop it. Polydamas warns Hector that this omen surely signifies that their attack will end in failure and that they will lose many of their own soldiers. Turning on him in fury, Hector warns that he will kill him if he sees him staying away from the fighting or encouraging someone else to retreat. He goes on to say that he puts his faith solely in the head nod of Zeus that promised him great glory, and no other sign will dissuade him. That said, he leads all of his armies through the trench and attacks the wall. Zeus's son Sarpedon and his friend Glaucus, both fighting on the Trojan side, share a brief word of inspiration before charging at the wall themselves. Sarpedon reflects aloud how their people praise them and honor them with all the finest wine and food because they undertake such deadly deeds as this to storm the wall or to fight in the Trojan War. Although he wishes aloud that both of them were immortal and never had to fight again, he accepts their lot as mortals, as lords and as warriors, and leads Glaucus and their soldiers into battle. They then try to climb the wall, but are attacked by great Ajax and his brother Teucer, who are waiting on top of the ramparts. Teucer shoots Glaucus in the arm, forcing him to retreat, and Ajax brains the soldier next to Sarpedon with a rock, narrowly missing him. Sarpedon then pries apart a portion of the wall with his bare hands before he, too, is forced to retreat by the attack of the two brothers. Zeus then allows the battle at the wall to become a stalemate, all according to his design. He comes upon Hector and helps him to lift up a great boulder, larger than any two men can lift, that he then uses as a ram to bash the gate in. With the wall now breached, Hector rushes into the camp, unstoppable, with all of his Trojan soldiers close behind him. So the opening lines definitely appear out of place at first. Why does it really matter if the Greeks sacrificed to the gods or not? At least, why does it matter for this part of the story? But if you remember the backstory to the Iliad, it actually makes a lot more sense. This whole war, Achilles' life, and the death of every single soldier here has all, in the end, been about ensuring the hegemony of Zeus and his siblings making sure that they are the most powerful beings in the cosmos. They must be those who are glorified above all others. All the immortal beings have to be aligned with them in one way or another, and those who are not are imprisoned, like the Titans, like Kronos, Zeus's father. Likewise, all mortal beings have to sacrifice to the gods in order to gain their favor and to avoid their punishments. You can't go it alone as a mortal, or pretend that you're going it alone that will immediately earn you the god's wrath for presuming that you are in control of your own destiny. That's what being a Greek god is. All those beneath you sacrifice to you, and all those on par with you either align with you or are imprisoned. 
So by the Greeks not sacrificing when building their wall, they defy the gods. They defy this very order of the cosmos. This is also why, I think, the gods sweeping the wall into the sea at the Trojan War's conclusion is called setting all things to rights once more. So again, this passage isn't necessarily out of place. It's a callback to why we're here, really, on a cosmological level, how it all came to this. Several metaphors and character developments signal the continuation of Hector's transformation. This is a transformation that I've said in the past I learned in a course long ago. I've since contacted the professor and found out that he became convinced of this by reading the work of Glenn Arbery, primarily The Sacrifice of Achilles, which is a chapter found in his book Why Literature Matters. I'll put the link in the description. It completely changes the way that you read this epic. Anyways, as I mentioned last chapter, any fiery imagery can be seen as an element of Hector's transformation. Homer says when Hector breaks through the gate, Hector bursts through in glory, his face dark as the sudden rushing night, but he blazed on in bronze and terrible fire broke from his gear that wrapped his body, two spears in his fists. No one could fight him, stop him, none but the gods, as Hector hurtled through the gates and his eyes flashed fire. Now I've mentioned the fire thing before, we've seen it happen in previous chapters, that's not really new. Whereas in this chapter, we do see more evidence of character and personality shifts as well. Remember when Polydamas interprets the bird sign for Hector when it flies in front of them. Hector accuses him of being a coward and then threatens to kill him, kill his friend, just for politely sharing his counsel. Just last chapter, we heard of a man who would accuse a friend without a fault. Hmm, who might that be? This is Achillean behavior. Hector is not like this normally. Remember how empathetic he was in Book 6? How he turned down wine, rest, and safety on account of his men and so that he could get back to them and suffer with them? Or even how he told Paris off for causing their deaths. In Book 6, Hector was a model of virtue, of courage, and temperance, and he sought to fulfill his duty as best that he could in order to keep his city, his family, safe. We've also seen him be very open to listening to the gods when they send a sign. Whether that's going back to the city to order his mother to sacrifice, to pray for victory, or whether he was told to hang back from the battle until an opportune moment. He's no stranger to this. But now he threatens to kill his friend for disagreeing with him, refuses to allow his men to sleep, and refuses to heed a bird sign that clearly foreshadows the deaths of many of his men, all in pursuit of glory. He remains unshakingly convinced and stubborn in the knowledge that Zeus sent him a sign, an irrevocable bow of the head, that he would be glorified. According to Arbery, it would almost be a sacrilege for Hector to refuse to follow this sign. In fact, I would say that Hector is just as stubborn in believing that Zeus has bowed his head to him to give him glory as Paris is, that holding on to Helen is the right thing to do. I say this because Hector uses pretty much the exact same words, speaking to Polydamas, that Paris does when speaking to Antenor, back when he was asked to return Helen. Paris in Book 7 says, Stop, Antenor, no more of your hot insistence. It repels me. You must have something better than this to say. But if you are serious, speaking from the heart, the gods themselves have blotted out your senses. I won't give up the woman. Hector, in Book 12, now, says, Enough, Polydamas. Your pleading repels me now. You must have something better than this to say. But if you are serious, speaking from the heart, the gods themselves have blotted out your senses. You tell me to forget the plans of Zeus, all he promised me when he nodded in assent? This is stubbornness and pride, the kind that comes when one thinks that they're owed something. Hector is so sure that he is owed glory, that he is willing to allow or ask for a ton of his own soldiers to die in order to get it. That should sound very familiar and very Aculean. Lastly, Glaucus listens to Sarpedon reflect about their homeland and how they ended up here right before they charged the wall. Sarpedon says that the two are honored as lords back at home because they undertake dangerous feats like this. Like I said, he also wishes aloud that they were immortal and that they never had to fight again. But now, 
As it is, the fates of death await us, thousands poised to strike, and not a man alive can flee them or escape. So in we go for attack. Give our enemy glory or win it for ourselves. That last line especially is remarkably similar to Odysseus' speech that he gives during his Aristia moment from last chapter. And while I'm thinking about it, Sarpedon kind of has an Aristia moment here in this chapter too. Homer's taking the time to prove Sarpedon's worth. He says, But not even now would the Trojans and Prince Hector have burst apart the ramparts gates and huge bar if Zeus, the master strategist, had not driven his own son, Sarpedon, straight at the Argives. Even after Glaucus gets injured and has to retreat, Sarpedon himself stays, clawing the rampart now with powerful hands, wrenched hard, and the whole wall came away. Sarpedon had made a gaping breach for hundreds. He proves that he's not a background character. Although, as I've said, I don't think there really are any background characters in this epic. We've seen this son of Zeus before, and we will see him again. Every time we see him, though, Zeus is going out of his way to prevent his son from dying. The first time it was from a spear wound, and this time it was to make sure that Ajax and Teucer's assault didn't hit a mortal spot or break through his armor. It can't last, though. Sarpedon wishes aloud that he was immortal, but he isn't. Neither is any soldier here. Not Hector, nor Achilles, none of the other soldiers, and not even the wall that they built. All of them will pass away soon, a blink of an eye for the immortal deathless gods of the Iliad. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new. If you did, please like it and share it with your friends, and comment below. Let me know what it was. Maybe we can start a discussion. Thanks, and I'll see you next week.